Hello and welcome to another OFX ATK tutorial. Today we'll be building a polyphonic synthesizer using OFX ATK and OFX MIDI. You will be able to build this synth without a MIDI controller. You could simply use a um, ASCII keyboard instead. As usual, we will go to our project generator. Give your project a name. We will need OFX ATK and OFX MIDI. I will be using a, um, a max pass just to show what I'm doing on the MIDI keyboard without having to use a webcam. This patch is in no way connected to what we're about to build in Open Frameworks. Okay, let's get rid of what we don't need. If you're not using a MIDI controller, uh, you will want to keep key pressed and key released. Include their libraries or add-ons. Um, we'll need to inherit from the base class OFX MIDI listener, which is housed in OFX MIDI. If you uh, want more detail on how to use the MIDI controller, click the link above for a previous tutorial. We'll need our standard loops, exit, audio out. and we'll need our uh, MIDI listener. Okay, and since we're using MIDI input, we'll need a MIDI in object. Okay, so if we're deleting these in the header, we'll need to delete them in the CPP. So we should have setup, update, and draw. We'll make our audio out function. Loop through our buffer. We'll make a current sample and set it equal to zero. And we'll output that sample. Oh, right, so let's uh, make our new message function. For now, we can leave that blank. And an exit function. We'll need to close the sound stream, unclose. And we can't close it if it's not open. So setup sets up the audio stream and starts it. We will grab the sample rate from OFX ATK and the buffer size. Okay. We have our, we made in our header our MIDI in class or object. So we need to do MIDI in list ports. I happen to know what my port is already, but this function will list all of your MIDI devices in the console. I'm going to go ahead and open port three since I already know what mine is. And then we need to assign the listener. Okay, so if we run the project now, we should be in good shape. 
before I do that, I'm going to change the size. Once again, we are not going to be drawing anything to the screen for this tutorial. So I'm going to make it small so it stays out of our way. <clears throat> Interesting. Let's see, where are we failing? Of sound. Oh, I put sound twice, that's interesting. Fix. Okay, presumably this works. If you have this um, list ports, you should see a list of your ports. My device is number three. Okay. <clears throat> so first we'll need something to play. The way I was taught, um, one way, to, or at least one way of thinking about uh, polyphony is uh, thinking about them as cubbies. Um, for those of you familiar, I, I know when I was in preschool, you walk into school, uh, you had these little cubbies to put your backpack, um, potentially your shoes, your lunchbox, uh, that kind of thing in. And there was an array of cubbies. <laughs> so what we're going to do is find something to fill that array with. So we, what we need to do is define a note in this case. Um, we will store this in a struct. Structs and classes, structures and classes are the same in C++, almost. Um, the main difference is that in struct, everything is public by default. In a class, everything is private by default. And we will want public access to all of this. So let's make a struct. Um, we'll call this note capital N since it's a structure. So we'll need something to make sound. I'll, for, I will use a wave table triangle oscillator. I will call it oscillator. Every note will need its own envelope. So constant time envelope. And let's store a, an amplitude value for each note. Okay, so what we'll need to do is make an array of notes. So each note is going to have its own oscillator, its own envelope that can be at any position, and its own amplitude. So we can make class note, and we can call this the cubby. And we'll make an array of 128 notes. So this is going to store 128 notes in a cubby. So our cubby is very long. Um, the reason this I'm choosing this value is even if you have a full size, well, a full size keyboard has 88 keys, but 128 covers all possible notes uh, with MIDI. However, if you're using, doing something non-standard, uh, non-equal temperament, uh, that it may not, but for MIDI, this is fine. Okay, so if we go to our setup, we can instantiate each one of those notes. So we have to loop through every single of those cubby positions. So int i equals zero, while i is less than 128, increment i. So we are going to loop through each cubby. And each cubby has an oscillator, so we'll have to instantiate that oscillator. So cubby at i oscillator equals wave table triangle and we'll set the initial speed. So fortunately with this method, um, the speed will not change in that cubby. So MIDI note 60 will always be C. So we can just instantiate that and forget about that. So we'll get zero to 127 and we need to convert that to a frequency value. So we'll get the MIDI note We'll convert to frequency, M to F. And then we can just put I there. And now all of our oscillators will be set to the correct pitch when they're instantiated. Now we need to instantiate the envelope. And we can just use the default values for now and we'll need to set the amplitude. So for now, we can just set it to one. Float, or whoops, cubby, at our cubby position, amplitude equal 1.0. <coughs> uh, 
Okay, so with this line of code, we've or block of code, we've instantiated every cubby, and with a frequency dependent on the cubby position, uh, they all get the same envelope and they all get the same amplitude. So before we do anything, we'll need to find a way to hear this. So once again, we'll loop through every cubby. So for every cubby, we'll have to process the sample. So cubby, or process the oscillator and process the envelope. Cubby at I dot oscillator. So that's our oscillator class, and then we'll need to process it for every sample. We will have to do the same for the envelope. Okay, and then we'll need to add the amplitude to the current sample. So we're going to accumulate every single amplitude value from the cubby and uh, add those all to our current sample. Ooh, I have noticed one mistake so far. So I am within the scope of this for loop. That means I've already made I. I already mean something. I need to use a different letter. So I'm going to use J. That way we know which J is now our cubby location. I is our location within the, uh, the buffer. All right, so let's make a value called cubby amplitude. Let's call it cubby value, just to be clear. And first, our cubby value, we'll just grab the current sample of the oscillator. So cubby at j dot oscillator dot get sample. We'll just grab that sample. Now we need to scale that value based on where we are in the envelope. So cubby value equals cubby value times cubby at j, our cubby location, envelope dot get sample. Finally, after we've scaled by the envelope position, which is zero to one range, then we need to scale by the amplitude value. Cubby value equals cubby value times cubby at j dot amplitude. And it's complaining about this, but I, th I don't trust it. I think it's wrong. Okay, so now what we should get is nothing because we have no way. I mean, all of the envelopes first uh, start with their gate off. So that means the envelope's amplitude values are zero. So even though we're processing the oscillator, processing the envelope, the envelope nullifies any note because the amplitude will be zero and there's nothing to turn the envelope on yet. So before we try to run this, we need to make a way to have no on messages. So in this function, we're getting the MIDI message and doing whatever we would like to do with that message at the time of the MIDI message. So we can say if the message status is equal to MIDI note on, that's just an enumerator. So if we get a MIDI message and it's a note on message, then we will want to set the gate of that note, the gate of the envelope of that note on. So if we go to our cubby position, and our position will be the position of the mini note. So message dot um, pitch, I believe it's called in this library. So the mini note that we were given so at that cubby, we'll set the envelope to on. Set gate to one. 
Okay, so I'm expecting a certain result. This should, the code should work. If we play a note, it will be, it will turn on. And we might as well be able to turn the note off. Else, if message.status equal to MIDI note off, we'll have the same code, a cubby at the position of the pitch. dot envelope so we're addressing the envelope here we'll set the gate to zero to tell the envelope to start decaying okay so ideally what we would have at this point is uh, if you play a c you'll hear a c if you play an a you'll hear an a and you can turn those notes off by releasing the notes however let's see what we actually get ah Oh, maybe it's, um, it's complaints were valid. Ah, uh, it's not get sample, it's get value. Perhaps I'll uh, add another function just so get sample works as well as get value. All right. So, fortunately, I'm not hearing anything that may be fortunate or unfortunate. Let's double check that I'm actually using, yeah, I am using the right port. Oh, haha. <laughs> All right, so I didn't get the error I was expecting because current sample is still zero no matter what. We haven't actually added the cubby value to the current sample. So the current sample will be equal to the current sample plus the cubby value. Now we should hear the atrocious result I was expecting. Oh, that was that was probably really aggressive on your end. I'll apologize. I forgot. Whenever I use Soundflower, I need to um, scale down any output we have. So current sample 0 0.08. So you don't necessarily need this in your code, um, but I need this for the screen capture. Okay, so I'm going to do the same thing. Hopefully not hurt anybody this time. So that's definitely, a, there's a G in there. Now there's, oh, I should pull this up. There's a C in there. But it's obviously not a triangle. Wave. Something's terribly wrong. Okay, so likely from programming audio in C++, you are very familiar with this error. Um, the issue is that it cannot calculate all of these samples in time for the audio thread. So... And why is that? Well, it might be obvious. We're trying for each sample to loop through 128 notes. Um, and this is whether or not we're actually holding those notes down. So it's even processing um, if the amplitude's zero, if the note's not even depressed. So there is an easy fix. This is one of the flaws of doing this with this method. Um, we're using RAM we don't need. We could set a polyphony number and limit it to that. but just to keep things simple for this part one, uh, we're only going to process the note if the note is on. So if, so we'll need a, a condition to determine whether or not that note is being played. And fortunately for us, the envelope can give us that information. So the envelope has a set of states and one of those states is off. So if cubby, so we'll check our envelope. So check the envelope in the cubby, and then we'll get state, get state. So the state zero is off. So if the state is not off is what we actually need, only then do we do this. Now what we have, even though we're looping through all of the cubbies, which is a little excessive, 
Um, that does cost CPU to loop through. Um, but we're only going to actually process, <clears throat> we're only going to actually process the notes that are currently active. So let's go ahead and run this. Okay, we're not getting any uh, underflow overflow errors. I'll hold down F. Let them go. Great, so that seems to work. <clears throat> So if you're ever in a situation where you need to build a synth quickly, uh, I mean, I, I still use this method if I'm in a hurry to build something. It's not the most efficient way, but it works. Um, and if you, if you don't need more CPU usage, you, know, you might as well. I wouldn't hand this off as a professional product at this point. Um, okay, so what we can do, right now all of our amplitudes are one, no matter how hard we press the note. Uh, MIDI keyboards give you velocity information. If you're using an ASCII keyboard, you uh, will not be able to do that. It's just on or off. But since we're using a MIDI keyboard, we might as well take advantage of this. So if we get a note on message, we can scale the amplitude based on how hard that note was pressed. So cubby, our cubby location is the pitch of that MIDI message. Dot amplitude. And uh, the, how hard you press a note is called velocity. Um, and that's on a scale of 0 to 127. So we can set the amplitude to be equal to the velocity of our message divided by 127 as a float. So this will put 0 to 127 in a range of 0 to 1. And it should be as simple as that. Whoops. So, you can't, unfortunately with my little graphic here, you can't tell how hard I'm pressing the note. But you can hear it. Okay, so we have velocity affecting the amplitude. Ideally, we would have a logarithmic relationship between velocity and amplitude. Um, right now we're scaling the velocity on a linear scale and sound, the uh, loudness of a sound is not linear. However, it's, um, this is very close and computationally efficient, and this is the standard way of doing it. Um, if you wanted to be a nitpicker, you could uh, find a way to make this a logarithmic relationship rather than linear, but we will not cover that in this tutorial today, at least. Okay, so we actually have an issue with this that is not totally obvious at the moment. Let's make it obvious. So let's, instead of using the default envelope, let's use an attack time of 80 milliseconds, a decay of 20 milliseconds. We can use the sustain of 0 0.7, and we'll use a long release. Let's do 1200 milliseconds as our release value. And run this again. So listen what happens to the tail of my note when I'm playing the same note. I'm going to go down an octave. So if you're listening carefully, and my compression hasn't uh, killed my high frequencies from the screen capture, then you'll hear a click every once in a while. This click is coming from a change, an instantaneous change in the amplitude value. So it's processing our samples. Our amplitude was one value, and then it changes. So the next sample will be instantaneously changed to a new value, and that creates a click. It's a sudden jump in amplitude. So we, do, we don't want that. We don't want that to be allowed. It's a subtle mistake, but it is a mistake. <clears throat> All right, so what we can do, OFXATK has a, um, a class called a parameter smoother. So instead of using float as a, or amplitude as a float, we can make amplitude a smooth value. 
So this is a floating point value that's uh, has a low, essentially has a low pass filter that you can determine the cutoff frequency by giving it a a duration to smooth the value over. So now we can't simply set cubby dot amplitude to one. Smooth value is actually a structure, but we can make um, ampli or yeah, smooth new smooth value, and we can set the initial uh, components in the constructor. So the current sample can be zero since the, all the notes will be off. The target sample or target value will be zero. And then the smoothing time will be, this, uh, minimally we'll set that to 20 milliseconds. Uh, if you wanted to make a legato control, you could make this a variable value and that would be kind of a legato knob or a legato parameter. Uh, what I want to do is make this value smooth so we avoid the clicking, but as fast as possible so we're not inducing legato notes. So these parameters should work. Now, we don't have to process a float, but you do need to process a smooth value. And uh, if you've watched any of my other tutorials, you'll know that I'm using smooth value different than usual. Uh, since my last tutorial, I've added um, a new constructor so you don't have to do the ridiculous uh, value setting and a new way to process that value so you don't have to write a very long line of code to accomplish that. So at our cubby position dot smoother dot process. And that's all we have to do. So now that will take our target value, smooth that and slowly bring it, or our current value and slowly curve that to our target value automatically. So we can't set cubby value equals, or times cubby value times amplitude. Sorry, cu cubby value equal cubby value times amplitude because amplitude is no longer a flow itself. We need amplitude dot current value. So this will receive the current value of our smoothing operation. Okay, so then one last thing. When we're setting the amplitude, we don't want to set this. This is a smoother, not a float. We want to set our new amplitude to be our target value. And that should be enough. Oh. My mistake, this needs to be amplitude.smoother. The smoother is within the amplitude class, or the amplitude value object. There we go, the amplitude object. So that's fine now. And then this is amplitude.current value, so that should be fine. Interesting. You know, I never believe, that's an issue with I've had with Xcode, is I never believe the errors because they linger for so long. We're probably still getting an error here. I know that's finally cleared up. Um, but let's, let's, uh, let's play ball here. You know, I thought I changed that. Perhaps I didn't. So smoother is, it's telling me that smoother is a, uh, a pointer type, so I can't use a dot. I need to use the arrow. You know, that's interesting. I, I think I'm just using this wrong. <laughs> All right. Um, see, there's a, let's just go to the class. Interesting. All right, so here's the constructor, which is working fine. And then if we call process, it should uh, set the current value. Oh, okay, I see my, my mistake. <laughs> uh, this is a recent change, so I'm not used to using this like this. We don't need to call smoother at all. We'll never need that anymore. We just process the smooth value itself. The amplitude is the smooth value, and we call process, and that takes care of it for us. 
And that's essentially just to save putting kind of a ridiculous line of code in our, in our project. So improvement was made to smoother. I'm clearly in an adaptation phase. So if you remember so long ago, we were trying to fix the problem of clicks in our sustained notes. So that issue should be fixed now. And that seems to be fixed, great. Okay, so we, we already have um, a fully functional polyphonic synthesizer. Um, one thing, one thing we want to do, or I should demonstrate, is how to use the sustain pedal. Since we're building a polyphonic synthesizer, it really makes sense to cover that topic. So let's first ask ourselves, uh, what does it actually mean to use the sustain pedal in a digital synth? On a piano, uh, the, the felt doesn't come down and dampen the note when you release the note. So all the dampers are held up. So what that translates to is we don't want to send note off messages until the pedal's lifted. So first what we need to do is um, get the status of our pedal. Um, let's make the, the pedal uh, on or off a, a, global, a relatively global value. So that'll be a Boolean, it's true or false, and we'll just call that pedal. So if the pedal is true, it's down. If it's not down, it's false. And at the beginning, since it won't, you know, it won't send a signal to ask the pedal if it's down or not, we'll just assume it's not. So pedal equals false. I mean, this will avoid an issue if somebody doesn't have a pedal, then they wouldn't be able to fix that. They wouldn't be able to make this true. So we'll start false. Okay, so in our MIDI section, maybe I should, that's clearly named. Um, the pedal comes in on the continuous control. So we'll need if message dot status equals MIDI control change. And I happen to uh, know on my, on my keyboard that the um, control number is 64. I have never used a uh, MIDI device where the sustain pedal is not 64. That would be surprising to me. However, I mean, it, it could happen. There, is, there are standards and protocols, but uh, people don't necessarily have to abide by them. So what I'm going to do, see, we can see out, but first let's just take care of it, assuming it's 64. So if message.control is equal to 64. So if it's a sustain pedal message, then we will want to set pedal to true if it was pushed down, to false if it wasn't. So if message.value is equal to 127, then pedal equal true. So it's using a full seven bits, or eight, eight bits actually, but a full seven bits to say true or false. So 127 is true, zero is false in this case. Else, if it's not 127 when, it, when we get a new value, then pedal equals false. So this is all if it's coming on 64. Um, and the off chance someone's watching this and your pedal number is not 64, um, we can do C out message dot control. And then when you push your pedal, the, uh, the control number should show up in your console. And let me know in the comments if, if in fact you have a keyboard and it's not 64, I'd like to know. Maybe I just don't, haven't used enough keyboards. <laughs> See, mine is 64. Okay, so we have our, uh, our MIDI, I'm going to get rid of this line. We have our, uh, our MIDI coming in and uh, it's working. So now we need to modify our note off. So we can make a condition. So when we get a note off, if the pedal, so this is what, what we do if the pedal is down, else if the pedal is not down,
So if the pedal's not down, we are going to behave as usual. So now if we run our code, it should work to a degree. So my pedal's not down. My notes are decaying as usual. If my pedal is down, however, those no off messages aren't coming through. And they will sustain until the pedal's off is what we want to happen. However, if I remove the pedal, they're not turning off. This is because if the pedal's down, nothing's happening. What needs to happen is we need to uh, turn off the dampers potentially for every note, but we don't want to do that. And the reason we don't want to set the gates for every single envelope is because another note could be down. You can imagine a piano, um, if you're familiar with the insides of a piano. If you're holding, let's see, a, a C major in your left hand, and then you hold a C in your right hand on a different note, and then you lift the chord in your left hand, then you lift the pedal, that C in your right hand that you're still holding down will still sound. So we don't want to close all of these notes off. We will only want to close the notes that were sustaining because the pedal was down. Okay, so to do that, we'll need to accumulate a list of notes that are only sustaining because the pedal's down. So in C++, we have something called a vector. A vector is a dynamic uh, array. So it's an array in which we can change the size easily. It's very handy. We, um, this, the format of a vector is you have these uh, less than or greater than sign and you put uh, the data type of your vector or dynamic array inside of these brackets. So our data type will be an int. So we're going to store the note numbers of the notes that are only sustaining because the pedal was down. And let's call this the pedal list. Okay, and we don't need to instantiate this. Um, that pedal list will be empty when it starts, and we only need to add elements when the pedal is depressed. So if the pedal is down and we get a note off, we need to add the pitch of the note off message. So to do that, we have our pedal list. And to add to a, a, a dynamic array or a vector, then we need to use the pushback. And we will push back the pitch of the note that was released. So message.pitch, which is the MIDI note, and our cubby location. All right, so every time there's a new note pressed while the pedal's down, we are adding to this list. However, there's this is just adding to a list. There is no nothing in place to uh, to dampen the notes once the pedal is released. So this is um, where we find out the pedal was released. So if we get a continuous control, it's on 64 and its value is zero, then we need to loop through all of that pedal, all, all of our pedal list, and that's easy to do with vectors. If, let's see, i, sorry, we need to loop through, so for int i equals zero, i is less than pedal list dot size, which returns the number of elements in that array, increment i. So we'll go through our entire pedal list, and then we need to, okay, and then we'll need to send a note off message to every cubby of those pitches. So say MIDI notes uh, 30 was down and 35 was down, we need to turn off the envelopes at cubby position 30 and 35. So for every element of our pedal list, we need cubby at pedal list i dot envelope dot set gate to zero. So that will turn off all the notes that were only uh, still on because of the pedal. And then once those have been released, we need to clear that list because those notes are no longer on because of the pedal. So to do that, we simply call pedal list dot clear. 
and now our pedal list is empty and ready for the next pedal depression. And since the pedal is off, we still need to make sure we're setting that. Let's just make this clear. Uh, pedal off, pedal on. sharp at the top and when I release the pedal that F sharp should continue to sustain but the G and D should release. Great, so it seems to work. I'll release the G, F, G and A. They, they continue to sustain until I release the pedal. Okay, great, and that uh, sums up uh, the basics of polyphony. As I said before, this is not necessarily the best way to do this. We are um, storing unnecessary synths in our RAM, and we are unnecessarily looping through synths that we are almost certain aren't going to be used in the near future. So in the next version of polyphony, or the next part of the polyphony tutorial, we will discuss a more sophisticated uh, and complicated method of doing this that will be a little more efficient. Thank you.